can keep you awake. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for joining the study in the first place and for giving freely of your data and your saliva and now your blood. Um, <coughs> you are really the, the vanguard. Uh, you're the only people who've come for this particular clinic. You're the pilot guinea pigs, I suppose, although Shona actually had uh, a little bit of a pre-guinea pig testing to check it was safe in humans. Um, but uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit today about the work we have been doing and the work we hope to do in our study, Viking Genes, if the machine works. So, Harumf. Nope. Nope. I'm going to have to do that every time. <laughs> yeah, this was working a second ago. So um, I hope I'm going to explain to you why we study the Northern Isles, why they're of particular interest, and get this concept of a distinct gene pool across to you, because that's what the people of the Northern Isles have. Mm -hmm. And once I've explained this to you, I'm going to try to pull out why that's important. It's all very well having a distinct gene pool, but why does that matter? Why does that matter for genomic medicine? I'm going to update you then on a couple of new aspects of our studies and new studies, and then briefly touch on what we're going to do with the blood samples today. And I'm going to close up with telling you some of the results of a recent uh, participant involvement survey that you may have taken part in. So, we all live uh, near or within the fine city of Edinburgh. Why can't I just study the denizens of Edinburgh? Why do I look for people who have grandparents from Orkney and Shetland? It's a good question, because it would be much simpler to just some study some folk off the street here, wouldn't it be? Um, and the reason why is because Orkney and Shetland are so-called isolated populations. What does this mean? It means they descend from a limited number of founders, a small number of ancestors that begat the rest of the population. And it means that marriage tends to occur within the islands, which is not the case in larger cities where people mix and come from many different places. So because of these two factors, this isolation and within community marriage, it means they develop their own gene pool. It's not wildly different, it's just subtly different from other gene pools. And it's different because many genetic variants that exist further afield are lost. They don't exist in Orkney or they don't exist in Shetland. But on the other hand, there are some genetic variants that rise in frequency. So you're beginning to get these slight differences and it's called genetic drift because these pieces of DNA, they drift upwards or they drift downwards and drift away. So uh, the first studies uh, that I ran were called Orcades and Viking, the Orkney Complex Disease Study in Orkney and the Viking Health Study Shetland in Shetland that some of your relatives may have uh, belonged to. So we collected 2,000 people uh, by running clinics in each place, uh, beginning all the way back in 2004. And I won't need to lecture this audience on why the populations of Orkney and Shetland are different in one famous way, because they are descended in part from Norsemen and Norse women who came from Scandinavia over a thousand years ago. So we have these populations that are part Scottish and part Norse, quite different from other populations. Now I'm gonna show you uh, the first of the genetic results here. So if you look at the graph, uh, you see lots of colored dots. Each dot is an individual human being. It's a representation of the DNA of that person. And I've colored them in according to where they come from. But the thing that's important to know here is that the closer together two dots are on this graph, the more closely related they are genetically, the more DNA they share. And you see a couple of things. You see that people from one place tend to be more similar to each other than they are from other places. You have a bunch of Tuscans here from central Italy at the bottom left in a blue purple color, and they're forming their own cluster and they're not that far away from a Spanish cluster. Over on the other side of the graph at the bottom right, we have a group of Finns from Finland who are again clustering together with themselves separate from the others. Up at the top of the graph in the center, we have the British and you can see that even at a European scale, Orkney is separate from the other populations and Shetland is even more separate from the other populations, separate even from the rest of the British Isles. This is the signature of having their own gene pool and it's because of a deep 
shared ancestry over centuries. And this fact I was pointing out to you that many variants have become rare and others have risen up in frequency in these populations. Now I'm going to give you a bit of background to what I call the, the population genetic structure of Scotland, the shape of the variation, how DNA varies across the landscape, if we were to imagine it as a map. How does the population break up into clusters? Um, how are these clusters related to each other? And where are these clusters found? So we can actually draw a tree. It's a bit like a family tree, but rather than relating individual humans, it's relating populations of humans. So we've done that in a large analysis a couple of years ago, using thousands of people from all over Scotland, England, Ireland, and Wales. And when you feed this into the computer to look at genetic similarities and genetic differences, you pull out 42 clusters branching together in a tree. And you can see immediately that the main feature is that there are two huge clusters that are separate from one another. The blue cluster on the right side and the red cluster on the left. And these clusters are actually Orkney and Shetland on the one side versus everybody else. On the other side, we have an English lineage, a Welsh lineage, an Irish lineage, Hebridean lineage, a Scottish lineage. So Orkney and Shetland are the most different genetic populations in the whole of the British Isles. Within Scotland, we can further divide into North and East Scotland, South and West Scotland, which genetically contains Ulster and the Isle of Man. So we can split people up into all these um, populations. And they're really amazing, actually, because we can enter the geographic domain by taking the midpoint of the birthplace of each of these volunteers' grandparents. So these people are volunteers who have all four of their grandparents born within 50 kilometers of each other. As so we then plot the midpoint of the grandparents and each circle is the representation of where in the British Isles that genome comes from. And we then, so we've taken the data, and we've put it through the program to determine who's similar to each other. We did not tell the program where they come from. And then we map back, where do they come from? And look at the amazing clustering. We see that all across central and southern and eastern England, it's all in one cluster. The plains of England, people moved around, the industrialization, people moved to the cities and mixed. But here in Cornwall, out at the extreme southwest, we have a genetic cluster. They have their own gene pool. When we zoom into Scotland, here, we see similar things at finer scales. We can actually tell people from Aberdeen apart from people from Dundee. So people from Aberdeen have been mating with people from Aberdeen for centuries, and people with Dundee have been mating with people from Dundee or Angus for centuries. And uh, there are many such clusters, uh, Hebridean clusters, um, Argyle clusters, and so on. And these are different gene pools, subtly different gene pools. Now, uh, when we focus uh, on our homeland, uh, we can see at even finer scales, we can differentiate people. Now, individual islands or parishes uh, can be separated. In Shetland, we can see uh, Unst separate here, Yell, uh, North Maven, Dunrossness, Borough Island, so on. The same in Orkney, we have people from Westry are separate from Sandy, from Bursley, from Sith uh, and everyone uh, is, is split up, can be split up. And it's over incredibly short distances. If those of you who know Shetland, uh, Burra Isle is only one mile away from the mainland and we can separate people genetically and it's exactly the same in Orkney between Rousey and the mainland. So this is now a different way of looking at it, more not so much about geography but about modelling someone's genome to ask where did it come from. So we take the people from England, Wales, Ireland, Scotland, Orkney and Shetland and ask the computer to model them as a combination of these uh, continental European populations. And you see that people come back rather similarly, but in different proportions. There's a huge amount of this French-like ancestry, a proxy for a sort of Celtic ancestry. This is actually um, highest. It will be of no surprise to anyone in Ireland, but it's actually present across the board in the British Isles. We then have a German-like ancestry in orange, which is highest in England, obviously because of Anglo-Saxons, but even the Normans, if you look back to the Normans, they mostly descend from the Franks, who were a German-speaking people. There is Germanic blood in all of us, even if we have nothing to do with the Anglo-Saxons. 
And finally, we have in the blue colors, Scandinavian, particularly Norway-like uh, ancestry, which peaks uh, in Orkney and Shetland, but is again found throughout um, the land. When we do a, a more uh, detailed analysis, looking purely at British and Scandinavian sources uh, for um, the Northern Isles, we can actually estimate very accurately the Norse component. Uh, you see it here uh, in purple from Norway and in blue from Sweden. So uh, the maximum Scandinavian component anywhere in the UK or Ireland is in Yale in Shetland at 28%. It's also very high in the west side uh, of Shetland. And then it's slightly lower in Orkney as we go down and then considerably lower in the Isle of Man, in the Hebrides and in Caithness. And this might explain some of the pastimes of the people in the Northern Isles. This is the, uh, the Christmas Day bar game. Uh, that while people in Edinburgh are eating their Christmas dinner, the men of Orkney are out having a big scrum on the streets. Uh, and a month later, their cousins in Shetland uh, have spent all year building this long ship, which they call a galley, only to burn it down. Now, I want to explain to you the idea of a population bottleneck. Uh, this is a key concept uh, in population genetics to do with how big the population is and the history of the size of the population. So how many people live in Orkney and Shetland today? You know, 40 something thousand. How many people lived in Orkney and Shetland in the past? Well, it's actually varied between around about 10,000 and 20,000 or a bit more in each place for the last thousand years, uh, I am told uh, by the best guess historians. So it's, it's not really varied all that much. Many other parts of the world have expanded out. And if you had 10,000 people a thousand years ago, you'd expect millions now. But of course, a very large number of people have left. You guys are in some way among them. I am one of them as well, but I mean more that they went to the Americas. They went to the new world. So we're missing a whole lot of our population. How many people founded the population of Shetland and Orkney? Well, we don't know that, we weren't there, but we can use a few tricks. We can look at surnames. So Orkney has about 260 indigenous surnames that are from Orkney. And about a hundred of those are Scottish, showing that there was this large Scottish component. We can look to Iceland where they're very lucky and they have a book called the, the Landnáma book, the book of the taking of land. And it names 3000 Norwegians who took land in Iceland. Norway and Shetland are much smaller than Iceland, even if they're a bit more fertile. And I'd submit that probably considerably fewer Scandinavians came. Um, so we don't, we don't really know, but it's, it's, it's going to be low thousands. Um, and much, much lower than in a cosmopolitan population like Edinburgh. So this is where the idea of the bottleneck comes. The source population is the bottle. There's many people, there are many gene variants. And then when a small number start a new population, you go through the bottleneck and you have this new population. You'll notice the colors of the beads are different. It means that the genes change. You're sampling from the parent population to create the daughter population. And this is what changes the genomes today of the people in Orkney and Shetland, generation after generation of this, from the initial founding, and it happened again and again, there was enormous, the Black Death in Orkney, it took 300 years for all the land in Orkney to be cultivated again after the Black Death. There were smallpox epidemics, particularly in Shetland, and there was a famine in Orkney and Shetland. 3,000 people in Orkney died between 1620 and 1640. That is going to change the genes that continued. So we can see this when we do some analysis. We, uh, again, a couple of years ago, uh, sequenced the whole genome. So read all the DNA letters of some people, 500 from our study um, in Shetland, and we compared them to a pretty much identical sample from here in Edinburgh. Actually, people born in 1936 who'd gone to school in Edinburgh in 1947. So they were a good sort of Lothian uh, comparison. And what was actually remarkable to me, so we, we look at all these people, we look at their DNA, and we find all the little differences, all these variants. We each, if we compared you and me, we'd be different, different at four million letters of our DNA code. So we're looking through hundreds of thousands and millions of letters, but what we found was that 10% of all the variants that we saw in Shetland had either never been seen before anywhere else on Earth, or they were 10 times more common in Shetland than they were anywhere else on earth, including Edinburgh. 
So it's not that people from Shetland are completely different, but they're significantly different in terms of their DNA. And this is talking about hundreds of thousands of variants. So this is what I'm talking about when I talk about a gene pool. It's, it's about this deep shared ancestry that changes the frequency of these variants. And what I think is important, if the fruits of genomic medicine are to be equitably shared out, then we need to understand our genomes and not just use the genomes of other people who do not have the same genomes that we have. This is what drives me to do this work. So what do you think these subtle differences mean? I'm going to try to explain to you how we can take this genetic information and learn about our health. Um, and because we have slightly different variants, it means the ones that are important for medicine are slightly different as well, or they can be. And we're gonna start with an example um, from the Viking Health Study. Uh, during the recruitment, um, one of the volunteers shared a letter with us that they had received from the NHS. Uh, telling them they had a relative with a disease called long QT syndrome. Um, and they had been invited to be screened by clinical genetics. So they were going to what they call cascade. So if someone has a disease, they go out to the first degree relatives. And when you find a new one, you cascade out like that. And that's how they find um, uh, families in the population. So we thought we would have a look uh, in our data. So I first should explain to you what long QT syndrome is. It involves um, a little bit of cardiology. So this uh, is um, a trace of the electrocardiogram. So it's simply a trace of the electrical activity of the heart through time. Um, and the disease is to do with a prolongation, so an elongation in time of a certain interval. So here we have a healthy ECG at the top. So you see the heartbeat going on. And here we have someone with long QT syndrome at the end. You see they have a longer cardiac cycle. They have a longer heartbeat. The distance between the beginning of the heartbeat and the end of the heartbeat is longer. So this might seem quite minor to you, but this is a very carefully and finely tuned system. And the disruption of the timing of the heartbeat can trigger dangerous rhythms, arrhythmias so-called, including the worst one of all, when your heart stops, a fatal cardiac arrest. And this doesn't usually happen at rest, but it happens in response to exercise, stress or surprise. When you hear about a footballer who drops down dead age 25 on the pitch, it's likely enough that he has long QT syndrome and they didn't know it. So it's very important to know about. There are treatments, you see, that can mitigate the danger. There are drugs, you can avoid the triggers if you know what they are, and you can actually have surgery to have uh, defibrillators or pacemakers implanted. Now this is a so-called monogenic disease. There's one gene, that uh, causes this disease, uh, in this case, a gene called KCNH2. And it actually is the instruction manual for a, a potassium channel. So it's for a protein in the heart that regulates the electrical signal of the heart. It makes sense. That's how the electrics of the heart are, are dysregulated. And it's an extremely, extremely rare uh, variant. Less than one in a hundred thousand people in a large UK database carry it. However, in our 500 samples, we found one person um, who carried this. We were then able to look out into uh, their relatives and we found two more. So these are uh, old fashioned sequence traces where we're reading the DNA. This is one person on the bottom here and you can read his codes along, T-C-A-C, G-C-A-T, C, and then a G. And at that point he's got a G, but the other person has both an A in green and a G in black there. So they have a mutation there. They have a rare variant, they have actually uh, a harmful variant that causes long QT syndrome at this point in their genome. And we can draw a pedigree. Here in the corner, ID1 is the first person that we discovered. And we can see, uh, if you know how pedigrees work, he has um, a nephew who does not carry the variant. He has a first cousin who does, and her daughter also carries the variant. So we're starting to find more people in our study who are not aware they carry this variant, or we don't know if they're aware they carry the variant. We can then use advanced genetics to try to work out um, what's going on here. We can read across this region and create like a barcode of their DNA. We can look at many, many different um, pieces of DNA, letters of DNA, and we can try to see, is there anything shared? And if you're good at puzzles, you might see for each person, we have uh, two copies, obviously, the DNA from mum and the DNA from dad. But you can see here that this 
copy is identical to that copy, which is identical to that copy. So these three people have the same DNA. They have inherited this from the same ancestor. And we know that from the pedigree. And you can see it here when we draw them out. But it means we can go out now to all 2,000 of our samples and see if anybody else has this. And lo and behold, we found two more people. And they're completely unrelated to the original family, at least so they think. We have family trees back to the 18th century. We can't track them. So actually what I think happened is there's been what geneticists call a non-paternity. So at some point in time, someone's father has not actually been their genetic father. And this family probably does relate to the other family. So there's no way they could ever have been linked. As the clinical geneticists are going person by person by person, they're never going to link to these guys because nobody knows this. I think that's one of the powers of these kinds of studies. They begin to call this genomic medicine now, that we're using DNA information as part of our medical care. And what cohort studies can do is identify across the board, not looking at the families who are already ill, just looking at everybody. This allows you to find people that you'd never find. It also allows you to understand what these letters of DNA are doing. If you only look at ill people, you're gonna become quite convinced that whatever DNA letter you're looking at causes illness. We look at everybody. And when we have a, you know, a much more balanced view of what's going on. Anyhow, this variant is actually 150 times more common in Shetland than it is in other Europeans. So it's had a huge genetic drift going upwards. And we can now ask this question about many other variants. Which other harmful variants are there? Should we be screening people from these places for these variants? We're interested in places like Iceland, Finland, the Hebrides, the Isle of Man, and so on. But to go back, to that second family first before we move on. Uh, actually, by coincidence, um, ID4, so this person at the bottom here, who is completely unrelated and completely oblivious to the fact she carried this mutation, got in touch with us in response to one of our social media promotions. Um, and she said uh, she'd lived in Aberdeenshire for over 30 years, but both sides of her family are from Shetland as far back as they can trace. And she thought it'd be interesting to take part in the Viking Health Study, predominantly as it looked like a free medical. She received a great report on her overall health and she filed it away at the time, thinking she'd never see it again. But several years later, she was contacted by her GP as they had received notification of a rare genetic mutation via the Viking Health Study. And it was discovered that she had long QT syndrome. Through genetic testing, we have since discovered that my father, and my nine-year-old daughter both have the same genetic mutation. Both myself and my daughter now take daily beta blockers to control our heart rhythm, and we see a cardiologist every six to 12 months. Neither of us have ever had any symptoms and live very fit and healthy lives, and we will never be certain, but it is possible that taking part in this survey has saved our lives. Thankfully, with medication, we, with the medication we are on, we are both able to continue to do all the things we love, including running. I can't recommend this survey enough. You just never know what you might find out. So this was very moving for me. I've been doing research for 25 years. It always is going to benefit some theoretical person 25 years in the future. Here's a real person today that we helped and her daughter and her father. Now I'm going to move on to another variant, a more famous variant. Uh, you may have heard of the BRCA genes. These are genes that can fair a risk of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, most famously carried by Angelina Jolie. Um, so this is a predisposition. It's not quite the same as long QT. If you have the gene, it doesn't mean you will get cancer, but you are at a highly increased risk. We found one of these variants in Orkney. We found 20 people who had it. And in fact, it turned out this was already known to NHS Grampian clinical genetics. But this one is 480 times more common in Orkney than it is elsewhere um, in the world. So we looked into our data to find out where it came from. And you can see here in this plot of where the grandparents of our carriers came from, that it's very strongly points to the Isle of Westry in the North Isles of Orkney. And indeed, uh, using pedigrees, we were able to trace all carriers back to Westry ancestors, but we couldn't link them. It was kind of the same story as the previous one. We couldn't link them together. And I think this is an older mutation. I think if we had family trees going back to 1600, they would link in, uh, but we haven't been able to do that. The paper records simply don't exist. But we used genetics again, and we could see 
that they're sharing, again, the exact same piece of DNA. It's quite hard to see, but there's a line straight down from the star shared in all of these comparisons. And it means they do descend from one ancestor. And what's more, the very small number of people that we found elsewhere, four people out of 200,000 in UK Biobank and one out of about 50,000 in Nevada who carried this mutation, they carried the Orkney haplotype. So these people come at some point in the past from Orkney. This mutation happened in Orkney, I believe. And laboratory studies have shown it is a harmful um, variant. NHS Grampian have found 14 female carriers, and then they also have six what are called obligate carriers. So that's, let's say um, someone had um, this variant and then their mother's sister's daughter also had the variant. <clears throat> You would infer the mother and the, and the aunt both have the variant as well, even if they're not in your study. They are obligate carriers. They must carry this variant for the, for the two in the next generation to carry it. So they found six of them and nine had ovarian cancer and five had breast cancer and one woman had both. So it looks, it looks quite strong. And these numbers may have got worse because some people had their ovaries removed prophylactically. When we look at our data, we have seven female carriers and we have nine close relatives who are obligate carriers. One has ovarian cancer and two have breast cancer, but our participants are considerably younger. And so we have yet to see who may or may not develop cancer. At the same time, it's possible to live to an old age with this variant. One of our carriers died age 90, cancer free. So there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence but it definitely increases the risk. We still have work to do on how likely you are to get the disease if you carry the variant. And both of these findings are in a category that we call actionable findings. These are harmful gene variants which are linked to serious diseases, but they can critically be prevented or ameliorated by NHS treatment. Uh, we estimate that overall about 1% to 2% of our volunteers have such findings. These could be long QT, hereditary colorectal cancer, breast cancer, familial high cholesterol, these kinds um, of things. Um, and what uh, will happen in the fullness of time is that we won't just trust our own data. So these are life-changing things to know. A new sample would be taken through the NHS to validate this information. And people would then follow the usual pathway of care. So we're in this tricky situation whereby the people in Orcades and Viking 1, we have the data, but we do not have the permissions to return these results. For you, we have your permissions, but we don't have your data yet. So hopefully within about a year's time, we'll have your data and we'll have their permissions, and then we can begin to return the results to those who want to know. Hopefully next year. So you will all have filled in uh, this part of the consent, many of you at least. Um, where you agree to have the actionable results returned to me. And I'm happy to report that 98% of people at a recent freeze had said yes to this. And it's, it's optional. 2% did not want to uh, know this information and that is their right. Uh, now, just quickly repeating what was in Kira and Lucia's poster. Um, Kira joined us to do um, a, a little project recently and the preliminary analysis shows that one in 66 people in Arcades and Viking carry one of these actionable variants. The majority of them are cancer predisposition genes and most of the rest predisposed to various forms of heart disease. Now moving on to Viking 2, the study to which you belong, um, the reasoning behind this was essentially to double the number of volunteers from Orcades and Viking to go from 4,000 to 8,000. If we're interested in these rare variants, you need very large numbers to study them because they're rare. You, you know, you need to collect many people to find and work with things that are down at 1% or half a percent. And uh, that's what we want to do with this distinct gene pool. So everyone in Viking 2 has two or more grandparents from Orkney or Shetland. And of course, you filled in an online questionnaire and we collected your DNA from saliva. So we've nearly got to 8,000. We're just 250 short of people who haven't completed the questionnaire. We actually have enough people who've consented, but they just haven't gone on uh, and completed the questionnaire. And you can see that they're from all corners of the Northern Isles, apart from Fula, for some reason. But uh, I may have to visit there to sort out my map. But we actually have an enormous number of people like yourselves who belong to the Northern Isles diaspora 
You see here, it's very focused on the east coast of Scotland. I mean, that's where people live, but there are many, many more, not that you can see here in Edinburgh than in Glasgow. And I think it's due to links in the past through the steamers and boats going to Aberdeen nowadays, but Leith in, in the old days. There's also a centre around Inverness and quite a lot of Arcadians in particular in rural Aberdeenshire where they farm. But there are other diasporas, perhaps less well known. There is a substantial diaspora across the towns and cities of England that I hadn't really appreciated um, completely. And finally, again, one that is known, we have a whole worldwide diaspora, very famously in New Zealand for mostly Shetlanders, across the prairies of Canada, mostly for Arcadians, but in, in many places. Look, Honolulu, Hawaii, Anchorage, Alaska, Nunavut, Cape Town, Hong Kong, all the ends of the earth. Now, speaking of a different kind uh, of traveler, uh, I wanted to just quickly uh, highlight another study that we ran um, this year. So I was approached, um, coming on for a year ago now, by Samantha Donaldson, a Scottish traveler, requesting that we study um, their DNA. So um, I agreed uh, to do this and set up a public participant involvement panel so that the traveler community could feed into the design of this project. And we agreed uh, that we'd ask three questions to identify the genetic origins of the travelers, the Scottish travelers, and indeed their subgroups, the Highland travelers, the Lowland travelers, and try to work out how these groups are related to Irish travelers, to English gypsies, as well as to settled Scottish people and other populations. And we hope to do similar things with them to better understand the overall patterns of health and disease and their genetic risk factors in the traveller community. Uh, those of you with Orkney heritage may know of this uh, famous matriarch of the Newlands clan, uh, Nellie Newlands. I just love this picture that I got from Strumness Museum. We call her Nellie Nowland. Yeah, Nellie Nowland. <clears throat> yeah, she, she travelled about. So um, the reason I think that the travellers came to me is because we did a study of the Irish travellers uh, about five years ago now. And here's another one of these graphs, the same as the first one I showed you. So each point coloured dot is an individual. The closer together they are, the more closely related they are uh, genetically. And you can see the same things happening. People are clustering. Here are the Arcadians. Here are the North Welsh the South Welsh, the English, the people from the borders of Scotland, the Scots, the Irish. And finally here, uh, finally here, the Irish travellers. So you can see that they're very distinct. They're at one of the extreme edges of the variation in DNA, but they're very clearly Irish. So they have a shared heritage with Ireland, but they are distinct to the Irish. And we're going to ask the question, where do the Scottish travellers fit? We were able to recruit about 200 of them and uh, we'll go forward to analysis in due course. Now, the other project that we have ahead of us uh, is the Hebrides. So the Hebrides also have features uh, of isolated populations. You might have spotted in the tree at the beginning, they have their own branch here, not quite as distinct as Orkney and Shetland, but uh, Skye and Lewis, where we had samples, formed their own cluster. Isla, interestingly, clustered with the mainland of Argyll. So we'll have to look into what's happening there. I was involved uh, in the Hebrides about 12 years ago in a project called Era Huan, or the On the Ocean. And we were able to sample about 150 to 200 people and show there was significant Norse heritage in Isla, Skye, Harris, and Lewis. So they also have Viking genes. And I've decided to expand our study out to include all of these populations, including ones that have never been looked at. Mull, Tyree, Col, Barra, the Uists and Benbecula, Jura, they've never been studied. We do not know what kind of DNA they have. So I'm hoping in a couple of weeks to actually expand out uh, our Viking genes cohort to our distant cousins in the inner and in the outer Hebrides. And this is the new logo that we'll be using to reflect the broadened scope of our study. Now, I promised I'd tell you a little bit about what happened today. Here we have uh, Alice and uh, Shona, as I said, practicing the true guinea pig uh, with this. And you'll have noticed we took many different tubes out of your arm, about 46 mils to start with. And so the first step is to let the blood clot uh, and then it has to be spun in a centrifuge to separate out into different components. So you've got a, a cartoon of it here. We get the plasma 
uh, that Jurgis was talking about, which is made up mainly of water, but proteins that he's interested in, but also other metabolites and hormones and so on. Then in the middle, we get a bit called the buffy coat. This is really important. This is your white blood cells. These are the cells that fight infection and do all sorts of important things and your platelets that are for clotting. And at the bottom then is a great big uh, lump of red stuff, which is your red blood cells, the cells that carry oxygen around the blood. So uh, we're going to use most of these components for different uh, purposes from the blood that we took. And I don't want you to focus in on this. This is just to show you how complicated it is. We took seven tubes. They're going to many, many different places, but I've colored in the middle column here uh, what's going on. So some of them are for so-called omics. So as Jurgis was telling you, there's proteomics, but there's many kinds of omics. So measuring thousands and thousands of molecules in your blood. Some of them are for DNA, you know what DNA is, so we can read the letters of your genetic code. Some are for RNA, so we can read the messages from your genes to make proteins. The ones in orange are for the future, to cryopreserve your samples so that future technologies that haven't been invented yet can be applied to them. But the one I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about is in purple, the cell sorting. So cell sorting is an advanced technique whereby we take your white cells from the buffy coat layer and we can split them up into many, many different subgroups. We use this amazing machine called a fax machine. So these cells are um, passed in a very, very thin uh, liquid, um, like, a, like basically coming out of a tap, but absolutely, absolutely tiny. So they go one cell at a time through this tube where they're zapped with a laser um, which either causes them to fluoresce or not fluoresce, depending on a treatment that they've gone through. This is actually happening as we speak in another room of this building for the first batch of your cells. And this afternoon, the next will go and some will happen this morning. And we can use this approach to stain cells and separate them according to the proteins that are on the surface of these cells. And we can split them up into seven different subgroups of white blood cell. So I've got a photo for you of the machine. Here's the laser in blue shining through. You can't see it, but there's a very, very thin stream of cells in the middle. And then there are magnets that according to the charge in the cells, push the cells in different sides like this. It's incredible. And again, I don't expect you to understand this, but I love this amazing plot. This is showing, so we go sequentially through it, top left, it can separate out the red cells from the white cells. We don't want the red cells, we want the white cells. Then within the, red, the white cells, we can separate out cells that have different markers on them. You may have heard of B cells that are involved in immunological memory. And then within that, you can separate things out depending on which kind of T cell they are. Are they cytotoxic T cells and so on? And you're always dividing down, dividing down until you've got seven different kinds, monocytes, eosinophils, neutrophils, and finally natural killer cells. So we're dividing all of these up so that we can look not just what's going on in your blood, What's going on inside your natural killer cells and how is that different from the next guy? Um, this has never been done before at scale and you are the first people that we're going to pilot this with. So fingers crossed it works. <laughs> now, as we come to the last part of the talk, I wanted to highlight our website uh, that you can return to again and again uh, when you want to learn more. There's lots of information there about the discoveries we've made in the past and as new papers get published, new little stories get put up there. So look to the website ed.ac.uk slash Viking and you can uh, move around and learn a lot about what's going on or if you want to show people who are interested in knowing what's happening with your data and uh, your DNA. There's also a new page I want to highlight on engagement and involvement. There's lots of interesting stuff in there uh, on what people think. And we actually did this survey that some of you may have taken part in 1,400 people recently completed it, uh, where we asked people what matters to them. What would they like us to study? So we asked them first, which diseases uh, we should study? And here are the top three results. So I don't think there's a significant difference, but the top two were heart disease and Alzheimer's and dementia, um, which uh, over half of the people wished us to study. From a, you know, They were given 20 to choose from. Uh, coming in third then was stroke. And there were a very large number of diseases in the middle, but the disease people least supported us studying was COVID-19, because I suppose people are quite sick of it. <laughs> we then went on to ask uh, which of a number of areas of research they would support um, from a choice of seven. 
And the top three were understanding the genetic distinctiveness of Orkney and Shetland, which I hope I've convinced you I am doing my best to study. They wanted us to study the risk factors for disease. So I haven't been able to mention Paul's poster here because I didn't have time, but that's this, it ties in with this sort of work of understanding how it all builds together. And finally, they supported, or you supported our work on actionable genetic variants, which again, we are putting a lot of energy into working towards, but there's a lot of ethical hurdles um, to overcome. And we asked them one last question, uh, did they support research into genetic history? And I'm hoping 79% uh, agreed with that. And I, again, I think I've done the right thing here by looking at genetic history. So it's extremely interesting to read this, but the most interesting thing of all were the free text answers. And it's, it's gonna take me a long while to get through them. 1400 people writing whatever they wanted about why they joined up and what they expected. And it was really humbling for me actually to read why these people like yourselves have given off their time and their data and so altruistically to help us to study health, history, Orkney, Shetland, heritage, uh, and just to contribute. Um, so I really think uh, it's an amazing cohort we have, and I want to thank everybody here and everybody else out there for joining it, as well as everybody in Edinburgh and elsewhere who has helped us on the analysis and in the actual doing it side of things. Thank you very much. So I've held you here for quite a while, but if you can bear it and have any questions to ask, I'd be more than happy to ask them and answer them here in front of everybody. But I'll also hang around a little bit afterwards if you want to ask anything uh, quietly. Are you all dumbfounded? <laughs> You mentioned the blocks of people in various parts of England with heritage shit and Orkney. Um, I noticed in uh, the ports actually in Liverpool and London obviously are going to attract um, seafarers. Um, yep. And that, uh, the, the same as the East Coast, of course, uh, Leith and uh, yeah, I th Shields. I, I, I think that's definitely true. Um, Shields in particular, there'll yeah. be a considerable number of people with Shetland heritage and maybe Orkney there as well. You can see actually different waves because um, uh, I didn't tell you the colors of the dots tell if they have four grandparents, three grandparents or two grandparents. The people with two grandparents, that's a generation ago that the migrant moved. The people with four grandparents have moved in their own, in their own generation. So you can see how the Canada ones are from a generation back, um, whereas the Scotland ones are both. There's people who've moved in their own time and people whose parents or even their grandparents moved. So it's a constant sort of process going on. It's quite interesting. And when, when we found that this BRCA variant, even in Nevada, actually came from Orkney, it's not just interesting for the sake of it, it actually might have some actual real importance for people. Good. Well, thank you very much for coming. I hope you've enjoyed and survived your your morning um we've got goodie bags you are spoiled i must say we've got, we've, we've got goodie bags for you before you go i think that's probably what shona disappeared off um um to get and we shall let you out back onto the main streets of edinburgh but, but thank you so much thank you. Thank you.